At this time, I'm going to ask Eric Jackman to come up and introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Bill. Uh, let's do another round of applause. How about that? <laughs> all right how's everyone doing tonight this is a beautiful crowd thank you so much all for coming out i recognize a lot of faces in here being a son of jaffrey ringe so how many here are from jaffrey ringe all right so i'm a uh <laughs> i grew up in ringe i lived in ringe uh starting in 97 I'm a proud graduate of Conant High School, class of 2005. We got any Conant in the house? A little bit. <laughs> right. And a proud graduate of Franklin Pierce University in the next town over. I know I saw Doug Lay walk in. Where's Doug Lay? Right here. Can I call you Doug now instead of Professor? <laughs> so, I'll be brief. I'm 32 years old, I live in Peterborough now, and I'm really excited about Tulsi Gabbard's campaign. I've been very cynical the last couple of cycles, and judging by the great turnout in this room, I would say a lot of people here have been very cynical. We get a lot of the same rhetoric, the same talk, the same propaganda from our politicians, and it's easy to give up and not want to be involved. In 2016, when Bernie Sanders was running, and I caught wind of this millennial-aged congresswoman from Hawaii who resigned her post with the DNC, very powerful plum position, resigned it in protest to how Bernie Sanders was being treated, I'm like, that's a leader right there that I want to stand with. So being 32 years old, we just hit an anniversary of the Iraq War. That's been, we've been involved in Iraq for 16 years now. Half of my life, we've been in war. We've been in Afghanistan even longer. I don't know about you guys, but I'm sick and tired of war. Are we tired of war? Yes. Are we tired of permanent warfare? Are we tired of America going around the world and thumbing its nose where it doesn't belong? In the guise of national security, when in reality it's about profiting a few at the expense of the many? I'm tired of that. And I don't want to see another generation of young Americans end up like the generation I grew up with who were recruited to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan, who were homeless, living under bridges, can't get access to health care, can't get taken care of, becoming addicted to drugs. It's a disgrace. And I'm tired of that. And I think you all are too. So I'm getting behind Tulsi Gabbard because she has vision. And this is a very real thing for her. Being a major in the Army National Guard, serving two deployments in the Middle East, one in Iraq, uh, the other one in Kuwait. In Kuwait, she knows this for real. She's got real skin in the game, and she's the only candidate, in my opinion, who is speaking with authenticity, clarity, and courage about America's foreign policy and many other issues. So I hope you will all give her a fair hearing and chat with her, ask her some tough questions, and please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you so much, Eric. Let's lift this up here. Yeah. My pleasure. <laughs> I'm not taller than you, am I? It might be. No, the lips. I'm a short guy. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out today. It's great to be here. And uh, thanks, Eric, for your introduction. Uh, thank you, Bill and Kathy, for your leadership and uh, for your service here in the community. Uh, I want to recognize Doug, your House Majority Leader. Thank you for making the time to come out today. You know, what, what Eric 
Eric touched on uh, is something that, that I know I feel and something that I know a lot of folks in this country are feeling right now is, is just how heartbreaking it is to see um, our country being torn apart to see how disconnected Washington is from the reality of the lives that, that we are living every day. With the challenges and the struggles and the pains and the hopes and aspirations that we see in our communities, that we hear from our friends and from our families. I can tell you now, serving in Congress for over the last six years, uh, it, it has been frustrating. Frustrating to see that disconnected, to see how the policies that are being made in Washington are not being made with our best interests in mind. That's really what it comes down to. They're not being made with the best interests of our people and our planet at the forefront. So what is the motivation? The motivation that's behind these policies being made are essentially either uh, self-serving politicians looking to gain more power, or looking to see how one political party can beat the other party without taking into account whether or not the people are winning or losing, uh, and special interests and corporations who are looking to pad their pockets and improve their bottom line. Whether we're talking about criminal justice reform, the environment, uh, education, the military, foreign policy, you can go down the list of many the, the issues that deal with our lives and our communities. And in each of these, we see how this uh, self-serving motive and desire for more greed is driving the reason why these problems don't ever get solved. This corruption of spirit is what is at the heart of what is wrong. This corruption of spirit that's casting a dark shadow over our country is the reason why the vision that our founders had for us has been so uh, lost. We are so far away from, from achieving and realizing that vision where we truly have a government that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. We, we, we say these words a lot, but I think oftentimes we forget how powerful they actually are, how strong this foundation was that was laid out for us in this country. And instead of, of really achieving that vision, we have essentially a government that is of the powerful, by the powerful, and for the powerful, or of the special interest, by the special interest, and for the special interest. Now, as we contrast that, we contrast what is wrong with Washington today and leaders in Washington to the inspiring stories and the beauty and the hope that we find in our communities across the country where people in our everyday lives are really living that spirit of putting service before self. Now, I'm grateful to have served with so many service members and people who really embody that, you know, who have made that promise and, and commitment to, if need be, lay down their life for our country and for our people. We see this in our first responders. We see this in children and neighbors and friends and doctors and teachers, people who are looking to see how they can make that positive impact in other people's lives. That's where I find hope and inspiration for, for who we are as a country and where our future lies. Because sometimes it seems like the obstacles are too great to bring about the big changes we need to see because it's been so tough, because we haven't seen those changes taking place for so long. But we know that that path forward lies when we stand together, when we stand together, united, regardless of some of the differences we may have, we may have regardless of where we come from or how much money we make or what our education level is, the color of our skin, the way we worship, who we love. When we stand together and stand united, putting that service before self, putting the well-being of our people and our planet first. There is no obstacle we cannot overcome. It's exciting when we know and we realize that the power lies within our hands to make the kind of change that we need to see. To bring about the kind of change we need to see in passing legislation like Medicare for All to make sure that every single person in this country can get the care that they need. 
regardless of how much money they have in their pocket. Bring about the kind of change in reprioritizing where our resources are going to make sure that our kids get a quality education, to make sure that we have funding for our teachers and for our schools, to invest in rebuilding our infrastructure, to bring about real criminal justice reform, to take bold action to address this climate crisis that we are facing and make sure that every single person has clean air to breathe and clean water to drink. These goals and these aspirations and these priorities, that is what it means to put the well-being of our people first. We have yet to achieve that because instead we see prescription drug companies profiting as families and people are suffering from opioid addiction. We see private prisons profiting as more and more people in this country are incarcerated. We see money going towards that broken criminal justice system, incarcerating nonviolent drug offenders rather than looking at how we can support and provide resources for treatment. The contrast between the challenges and where we find the answer is stark. And where we find that answer is in these uniquely, uniquely American ideals of putting service above self. Because that's really what our founders laid out for us. That we would have leaders of, by, and for the people whose sole mission would be to serve the people who entrusted them with their vote. That trust and that responsibility is a great thing. It's one I'm grateful to have earned from my constituents in Hawaii, both serving at the state legislature, serving in our city council, and now in Congress for over six years. And it's that trust I'm asking from each and every one of you to continue that service, to bring this leadership built on those principles that I know are in, in, in a soldier's heart of putting service before self to the White House, to bring those values of, of integrity and character and honor back to the presidency so that our White House can be that beacon of light and hope and opportunity and equality that our founders envisioned for us. Now we know there are so many of these challenges that we need to address. The question then is, okay, how? How do we do that? There's an issue that's central to the rest that you'll not hear any other candidate for president talking about, which is unfortunate. But that issue is the cost of war. And the fact that we are spending, we continue to spend trillions of dollars on counterproductive regime change wars in other countries. Wars that increase the suffering of the people in those countries. Wars that take a toll on our service members and on our veterans those who pay the ultimate price never being able to make that trip home to see their loved ones and their families, and those who do coming home with wounds that are both seen and unseen. <coughs> These wars are undermining our national security, strengthening and, and uh, expanding terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda while the trillions of dollars that are coming out of our pockets to pay for these wars are dollars that are not going to serving the needs of our people. All of those things that we just talked about. So we're continuing to spend trillions of dollars on these wasteful wars. While this administration is ramping up a new Cold War, increasing tensions with countries like Russia and China, pulling out of historic peace treaties like the INF Treaty, which 30 years ago drastically reduced the numbers of nuclear weapons in the world, making the world more safe. Instead, Trump has taken us out of this treaty and just in the last several weeks has now begun building more of these cruise missiles that violate that treaty, bringing us and the world closer to the precipice of nuclear catastrophe. We're at a point now where we are at greater risk of nuclear war now than ever before in history. I talk about this everywhere I go because it's real. 
just just about a year ago in Hawaii in January of last year, there was a alert that went out across over a million people's cell phones. A lot of you are nodding. You know about this. It was terrifying to get this message that read, Missile incoming. Seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill. It's tough to imagine literally having minutes to live. You wake up as early on a Saturday morning in Hawaii thinking about, maybe we'll go to the beach today. You take the kids to the soccer field, and then you get this message. What do you do? Where do you go? There was nowhere to go. His father lowered his little girl, probably seven or eight years old, down a manhole, thinking that that may be the only place she could be safe. Kids on our University of Hawaii college campus were sprinting across the campus trying to find a building that they felt might keep them safe. Now this was a wake-up call. This, this proved to be a false alarm, but everyone reacted in the way that we did because this threat is real. And so this was a wake-up call, not just for Hawaii, but for the country, about how serious this threat is. It doesn't have to be this way. I'm running for president because I don't want any one of you, I don't want any one of your families, I don't want anyone in this country to have to go through that, to live with this threat looming over our heads. I'm running for president to end these wasteful regime change wars, to work to bring about an end to this new Cold War and nuclear arms race so that we can take those resources, take those dollars, bring them back here to our pockets, bring them back here to invest in serving the needs of our people, to make sure that everyone gets the health care that they need, to make sure that our kids get the quality education that they need, to make sure that we are investing in a strong and bright future for our families today and for generations to come. These are serious issues. There is so much at stake. The experience that I bring, both as a soldier, as someone who's worked on the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committee, Someone who cares deeply about our country is what I bring to the table. It is what I offer to you. I ask for your consideration to allow me the opportunity to serve you as your president and commander-in-chief. Thank you so much. Aloha. Yeah, so we'll uh, take a few questions. Um, we'll start with you right there up front. I'm wondering, um, given the recent controversy around Ilhan Omar's comments about Israel, um, how you felt about that and whether you feel she's in this uh, I think we have Can to be very... repeat the question so we can hear yeah, it? Yeah, I know, the microphone. She, she's asking about the recent uh, comments made by Congresswoman Ilhan Omar uh, and whether or not they were anti-Semitic. I think the um, using those anti-Semitic tropes that have a long history of being used against Jewish people um, is something that is, is not acceptable. Uh, as a practicing Hindu, I have been on the receiving end of similar types of uh, religious bigoted comments and accusations. And I believe strongly that no matter uh, what way we choose to worship, or if we don't choose to worship at all, it's important for all of us to stand up against religious bigotry. Uh, I also think that Representative Omar uh, was trying to raise deeper issues with regard to our foreign policy that deserve discussion, that deserve an open and safe debate so that we can address some of the underlying issues that she was raising. Okay. Kath Allen, National Committee for Social Security and Medicare. Do you mind September? standing up and projecting so everyone can hear? Um, I have a two-part question. Sure. Where do you stand with the changes now for the Social Security? We're trying to get uh, it stabilized because there's the age raising and benefits cutting, privatizing going on. Yeah. 
talk of trying to do that. We don't have a fair COLA. And with the average Social Security check of a little over 17000 a year, an awful lot of people are living on far less than that, trying to survive on far less. So that's one part of the question. The other piece is, in the long term, is there any talk about trying to do something about the unfair system where the Social Security is based on income, but we don't have an adequate living wage in this country? A lot of people, our minimum wage is seven and a quarter. It's going up here, but in the long run, there's not enough money when you're in retirement, when you're working on a non-livable wage without it becoming a uh, welfare uh, program okay, to keep it sane. Thank you, and thanks for your, your long-time leadership and work on these issues. Um, Throughout my time in, in Congress, and from the very first time I ran, I have been uh, completely committed to both preserving and protecting Social Security and Medicare, and continuing to try to find ways that we can strengthen these programs. For all the reasons that you mentioned, uh, there are many states like ours in Hawaii where we have an incredibly high cost of living. And when you deal with the rising cost of healthcare, the rising cost of prescription drugs, and uh, these benefits that exist uh, not being adequate just to meet a very basic uh, living um, requirement uh, speaks to the need for us for us to do so uh, for the six years that we've been that I was in first six years I was in Congress Republicans were in the majority and there was kind of a constant effort to seek to undermine these programs now that Democrats are in the majority in the house we have an opportunity to bring forward legislation that can begin to kind of shift things in the right direction. Um, so I remain committed to doing that. We've got some different ideas on how we can approach strengthening Social Security, and I think strengthening uh, and improving Medicare and expanding it to Medicare for all. Uh, I think there's, a, there's an issue there that, that you're touching on that, that I want to expand a little bit on, uh, which is the fact that it is not just those who are eligible for Social Security who are dealing with the fact that most people in this or many people in this country are not earning a living wage, and the fact that we have not raised the minimum wage in this country uh, for a very long time. Uh, I'm a supporter of the, the legislation going through Congress to raise the minimum wage and been a part of this fight for 15, but also recognize even with that. Uh, a living wage in Hawaii, for example, is something north of $25 an hour. 15 bucks an hour does not even begin to pay uh, the rent uh, in a state like ours. I know there are many others that are the same. So um, I think we've got to take a more comprehensive approach to the reality of what people in this country are facing and uh, re-look at how our existing programs uh, are working or not working to help address those needs because it has to do with health care, it has to do with affordable housing, of which is another major problem in this country, and it has to do with the fact that most people working full-time, maybe sometimes even two jobs, are still not even able to, to survive. In the long run, the other piece of that, uh, a way to make it not a welfare system, to somehow fix the Social Security structure for those already on it, which is inadequate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these, these are, the, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, uh, my goal is to take a comprehensive approach to this, both for the problems we're dealing with now, as well as how we can look at how these programs have worked and how many of them have not worked for too long, and be creative in how we are addressing these issues, yes, for the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Back there. Hi. Thank you. This is a, this is actually an issue that we've dealt with quite a bit uh, in in my home state of Hawaii, and have dealt with quite a bit in Congress. 
Uh, I've been a leader on legislation to uh, make mandatory labeling, mandatory GMO labeling, and fought against the legislation that was actually pushed forward and signed into law under the Obama administration called the Dark Act, which it sounds like you're very familiar with. Um, similarly, on, the, on the, the front of pesticides and chemicals that are contaminating our food and poisoning our people, uh, we've put forward legislation to uh, ban some of the most uh, prevalent um, toxic contributors. Uh, you know, I think more and more, I think, feel like every week there's a news story coming out about how Roundup is being found in almost everything that we eat, <laughs> whether it's cereal or honey or, I mean, ac across the board. Um, We've got, a, we've got a lot of work to do to get to the point of what you're talking about where we don't have chemicals poisoning our people. Um, there, as I post a lot of these stories on uh, social media and try to help educate my friends and people who follow me on social media and our colleagues, there's still a lot of misinformation that's out there and a lot of people who just say, meh, who cares? Who cares? But as we've seen, I think, in California where... Uh, uh, there was a lawsuit that was um, uh, taken and was, was successfully taken against uh, the company that sells Roundup, Monsanto. They, they were just bought out, right? Um, because of the negative implications that somebody, it's cancer, right? There you go. So the more, so I think, I think we, we have to take multiple approaches to this. Uh, raising awareness and providing people with facts and information is essential to be able to build a support around changing laws nationally, at the state level and at the local level. Uh, and it's leaders like yourselves who are driving that change here, but also looking at taking that legal action to get recourse for the fact that we've been poisoned now for, for decades, if not, if not generations. That's right. And that was the last point I was going to make on that is the money. Um, you know, these multinational corporations who I either make, make these pesticides or use them uh, in their products uh, do everything that they can to try to um, cloud the issue or, or um, change the conversation and distract from the reality of, of the risks that we're facing. Uh, and this is happening, you know, at, at the local level. And unfortunately, a lot of times the arguments that are used in Hawaii, for example, we have Syngenta and a lot of these um, big multinational ag companies who test their products on our farms. And rather, a lot of folks in the local community are saying, hey, we need to know what you're testing. We want to know what you're spraying, how close you're spraying it to our waterways and to our schools and to our communities. We need to know this information. And a lot of it is being blocked. Um, and the response that's given is, well, hey, look, look how many people we employ. But they fail to say that on the island of Kauai, for example, all of the workers at this one particular site, um, they were poisoned by chlorpyrifos, violating the EPA's rules under the Obama administration. The Obama administration rightfully banned chlorpyrifos. Uh, this company violated that and they were able to get off with a slap on the wrist. I think they gave a very small amount of money to each of those employees for the, the harm they had uh, effected on their health. Uh, so that's one example. We introduced legislation in Congress to ban ba actually ban chlorpyrifos because when the Trump administration came in, they lifted the regulatory ban the Obama administration had put in place. So thanks for raising that. We've got a lot of work to do on that issue. Right, uh, right here. Hi. I'm so glad to see you a second time, and I'm here representing Real Progressives, which uh, are, there's about 150,000 plus of us um, who are from all backgrounds, independents, Democrats, Republicans, following you, and we are wanting to ask you if we're going to start talking about the power of 
the congressional purse, and that we have sovereign currency, and that we went off gold in 1971, and anything that gets appropriated for will then be paid for. Will you be going forward? Uh, I'm hoping you will with that in your mind. And we're also hoping that you're going to bring something big like FDR did to the country. And we're liking what you're saying and your attention to just GMOs and, and all of it, our vets, all of that. Thank you. Thanks for your question. We, we need, we are long overdue for a massive uh, and aggressive and bold plan to invest in our people and our communities. For far too long, as trillions of dollars have been spent on waging more of these wasteful regime change wars and building more of these weapons that make our country less safe, we are simultaneously told we don't have enough money for your infrastructure, so your tap water is poisonous to drink. Deal with it, right? That's what they tell us. Tell us, they don't, we don't have enough money to pay for special education teachers for your kids. We don't have enough money to make sure that your roads are safe and your bridges are safe. We don't have enough money to actually invest in sustainable and renewable green energy and a green economy. Time and time again, these politicians tell us, sorry, there's just not enough money. Deal with it. But on the other side of their mouth, they are either voting for or advocating for more of these wasteful, counterproductive regime change wars that are bad for us, bad for the American people, bad for our economy, bad for our national security, what to speak of the fact that these wars that are so often waged, waged under the guise of humanitarianism, they end up creating more suffering, death and refugees and destruction in the countries where we wage these wars. This is why people say, Tulsi, why do you talk about foreign policy so much? What about what's happening right here? This is why. This is why. Because we need to we need the resources to serve and take care of our people. And as long as we allow these wars to continue that have been waged under both Democrat and Republican parties and administrations, as long as that continues, we will continue to see the status quo. That's what I'm seeking to change. Thank right, you. We do a couple more. Uh, right in the red hat there. Yep. Oh, uh, hello, Congressman Davin. What's your um, name? Alden. Nice to meet Alden. you, Alden. Thank you. So, given ICE's <clears throat> documented history of discrimination, the assumed credibility of asylum seekers, and its re recent creation that has already curtailed human liberty, would you abolish ICE in your first 30 days as president? You know, abolishing ICE will not solve the problems that we're seeing today. That's a fact. Uh, it sounds like something that might be good to do, but unless we deal with the underlying problems, we won't see the actual change that we need to see, where those abuses of power are hurting people who are seeking asylum in our country. That's what we need to address. That's what we need to change, because you get rid of one agency, there will be someone else coming in to fill that gap. Uh, as a nation, as with every nation, we have borders, and those borders um, must be secure. It's how we do that, and it's the kind of laws we have in place, and it's how those laws are enforced that we need to address and that we need to change. It's why we need comprehensive immigration reform. It's why we need to make sure that we're putting resources towards those judges and administrators and providers who are working at the border to, to process those, to, to uh, meet those who are at our borders seeking asylum. Uh, the kind of change in the leadership we need to see to deal with the abuse of power where we have an agency in ICE right now that is essentially running rampant and doing what they, what they choose. Uh, they themselves have said this. There have been articles talking about how uh, there's, there's no real direction or oversight at this point. So that's what I would seek to change. We've got to deal with the root cause of these problems if we if we want to actually solve them. Thank you. Do one more. Gentleman right there. Yep. Hello, I'm Jonathan out there. Yes. Um, my question is, 
I know you're kind of alluded uh, to your views on Israel and uh, what Ilan Omar had said. Uh, and basically, I want to ask, do you acknowledge uh, Arabs and Ethiopians as being Semitic as well? Because uh, the Quran is written in a Semitic language, uh, and there wouldn't be the Quran if it wasn't for the Torah. So uh, my question to you is, how could Ilhan Omar be anti-Semitic when she follows a Semitic religion, and she clearly knows that this religion comes from Judaism? As all Muslims, any good Muslim would know that. <laughs> what I was talking about was the words that were being used. And these are words and references that have been used uh, in a very offensive way for a very long time against Jewish people. I'm not going to repeat, I'm not going to repeat what was said. Uh, my, my point is here, uh, so Rather than seeing question. how we are being divided, what I took from her comments was the underlying issue that needs to be addressed, which was buried because of, um, frankly, because no one wants to talk about them. No one wants to talk about how um, foreign influence in our elections is affecting policymakers. No one wants to talk about how foreign money is influencing think tanks and lobbyists and politicians in Washington. I think for us to move forward, these are the issues that I believe that we need to address. Uh, that's the bottom line. So we'll see, I want to thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming.